that this copy died in Harlem. You think they get the warning? I was dancing when I saw his brains run out on the street. And Romeo had Juliet. And Juliet had who Romeo? And Romeo had Juliet. And Juliet had a Romeo. I'll take Manhattan in a garbage bag with Latin written on it that says it's hard to give a shit these days. Manhattan sinking like a rock until the filthy Hudson, what a shock. They wrote a book about it, they said it was like ancient Rome. The perfume burned his eyes, holding tightly to her thighs. And something flickered for a minute, and then it vanished and was gone. No man's a jest of playing Shakespeare Round your throne room floor While the jugglers act as danced upon The crown that you once wore your car to yours cannot be called best friends see those hide your troubles where those had to cry bombers and resin cries to sing Take my word and go But tell the ostler that his name was The very first that Charles And if my hands are stained forever And the altar should refuse me Would you let me in? Would you let me in? Would you let me in? Should I cry? No man's a jest of playing Shakespeare 
around your throne room floor While the jugglers act as danced upon The crown that you once won The king of death The king of death The king of death Hello everyone, hi! Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to see all the little names in the attendees section there. It's so great. Um, I'm going to start by doing a land acknowledgement. Uh, so today's speakers are joining us from across Turtle Island. We recognize the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples, the unceded ancestral territories of the Silk and Sequetmic nations, the ancestral territories of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit and Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and in the heartland of the Métis Nation. We invite you to let us know where you are listening from in the chat below. My name is Jamie King. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Caravan Farm Theatre. Um, and I'm going to let my fellow uh, panelists here introduce themselves. Pass it over to Christopher. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, so I'm Christopher Gaze. Um, I'm the artistic director of Bar on the Beach Shakespeare Festival here in uh, Vancouver, BC. Excellent. Eva? Hi, I'm Eva Berry. I'm one of the co-artistic directors of Shakespeare in the Rough, which is in Tecoronto. Excellent. Hi, I'm Rodrigo, and I'm in Treaty 1 now, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I'm the Artistic Director of Shakespeare in the Ruins. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, just a couple little housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, there is a Q&A function if you'd like to ask questions of the panelists down at the bottom there, um, and they will be sending the questions to me so I can ask them. Um, and if you'd like closed captioning, there is also a closed captioning button right at the bottom of their Zoom um, if you would like captions for this as well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, first things first, I, what I wanted to ask, and this is for all three of you, we can kind of, maybe it'll be a little bit messy at the beginning, just jumping in, but what was the... I wanted to kind of ask what your intro to Shakespeare was, but more so what the aha moment was, like where it landed that this is something that you're going to base so much of your life around and the words that you're going to base so much of your life around. What was that kind of that moment where the little light went off? <laughs> you probably want to go first, Chris. <laughs> 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 Eva. Okay, go right. first, Eva. Go first. Uh, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think that I, it took me a long time to come to Shakespeare, um, partially because it took me a long time to come to theater. Uh, I'm from, I'm from Alberta. I'm from Okotoks, Alberta. Um, and uh, I'm very proudly the daughter of immigrants and my father is brown. My mother does English as her second language. So uh, theater was not our thing. We did not see our, I did not see my family on stage. I did not see, uh, I did not see my world on stage and let alone, I didn't see Shakespeare, that in Shakespeare. Um, so I, my first, aside from like high school reading, uh, my first intro to Shakespeare um, whew, was when I was in India <laughs> and um, I was teaching at a school and the principal of the school is like, oh, you're going, you're, you're about to go to theater school. I was very young. And she was like, oh, can you direct a play? And I was like, yep, because I was 20 and believed I could do everything. Um, and then she's like, great, do the Midsummer Night's Dream. And I was like, perfect. I went to an internet cafe. I, um, I spark noted <laughs> a Midsummer Night's Dream, tried to figure it out, and then came to these 13 year olds that I was working with. And I was like, okay, how do we, how do we put this up together? And how do we bring ourselves to this work? And we created a pretty, like in my eyes, a pretty fun midsummer. Uh, it involved a soccer match. It involved a lot of dancing. Uh, and it was a really uh, 
we, we took some of the text and then also the students spoke in their own languages as well. Um, and then I went to theater school and I was told that, um, I had a wonderful teacher. I had a wonderful teacher named Ian Watson. Um, and I found, my, I found re real joy and passion in the language. But then when I graduated from theater school, again, I didn't see myself in Shakespeare. So uh, that was a troublesome moment in time. And I, I went away very decidedly from Shakespeare until I started working more as with Shakespeare as found text, Shakespeare as a jumping point, uh, Shakespeare as a form like small s Shakespeare. Uh, and that brought me to Shakespeare in the rough. And when uh, they inv invited me to be their associate artistic director at the time, I said, okay, but I'm not, this is how I approach Shakespeare and I'm not gonna change. <laughs> and that was how it went. And we've had a lot of fun together since then. And like my relationship to Shakespeare is ever changing and ever growing. Um, and what I love most about it is that there is this freedom. There is a huge amount of ways that we can have our in and we can uh, take what we want and leave what we don't. Um, so that's, that's what I, that's what, that was my, that's my long aha moment. <laughs> what, what was your aha moment or has it kind of, has it, is it keep a highing? Do you keep going through them? Um, you, 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 me, I'm going? Sure, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. You mentioned Ian Watson and something inside of me kind of just cracked right now. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Ian was, uh, Ian saved my, my, my ass in Stratford a few times. He's a, he was a very passionate man, Ian. Uh, but like, like you, I came, I came through Shakespeare via a phenomenal teacher. I was very, very lucky. His name was Mr. Gord McLeod. And I was fresh off the boat here in Winnipeg. I was 18. So that's, I turned 38 yesterday. So that's 20 years ago. Um, and um, so 20 years ago, I was fresh off the boat in Winnipeg from Brazil, and uh, and we were supposed to start studying Hamlet, and I was terrified in the first, the week before that. I was just petrified, because I was like, what am I, I don't speak English, and I don't get Shakespeare in Portuguese, let alone in English. I'm, I'm going to fail this horribly. And then, um, and then um, the day came, uh, day one of Hamlet came up, and um, and something strange happened. You know, the first lines are, who's there? And I was like, I don't know who's there. I don't know what I am, what, who I am. And something again, just like when you just mentioned Ian Watson, something cracked inside of me when I, when I heard those first sounds in English uh, of, of the first lines of Hamlet. And I just got just really, really um, enamored by the sounds. It was something beyond uh, a meaning, beyond etymology. It was physical. It was sensual. It was. It was. It was just you know, like so often in his plays, the 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 words sounds are portable. They have weight. You know, like Hamlet says, "I will speak daggers to her," and when she, and then she says, "You know, your words like daggers enter mine ears." There's something about words being weighty and having sensuality about them, and that really fascinated me. Like this, like a, like a switch. You know. And but for me the, the and then the actual moment extended from that was realizing that everybody in the classroom I was in was confused by the English language, not just me anymore. As the only immigrant who was like English is strange, for these kids who were all you know English speakers as a native language, uh, uh, they were also like I don't know what he's saying in these pages. What is the what is this? What's going on? So we're all democratically confused by English. <laughs> So that for me was, you know, like I, I stole this expression from uh, the idea from, from the RSC, Greg Doran. He says that Shakespeare is a passport through his life. And I really use that for myself as well. It, is, it, it was a cultural bridge for me, ironically. I know he is still this monolithic, iconic thing of, you know, Anglo dominance over the world. But for me, he was a cultural bridge that made me fall in love with English uh, as, as, a, as a sonic experience. And made me feel like I belonged, and and I couldn't. I was obsessed with cracking the code and trying to understand and trying to familiarize myself with with what he was trying to say in that super nebulous play and and and, and of Hamlet. And and then I just couldn't stop. So I, I studied 
that in university. And then I went to England for more training. Then I ended up uh, at Stratford of all places, which is, you know, the place you kind of want to go and, and, and play around. And that's where I met Ian Watson. <laughs> and um, so for me, it's been, and then, then back to Winnipeg to, um, to lead SIR now, which was the first company to give me my first professional role. So for me, it's been this obsession about trying to crack this code. I still think that I don't understand what he's trying to say really. So that doesn't, I just can't stop obsessing about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great answer, Christopher. What was your aha moment? I I don't think I can, I don't think I can top um, <laughs> what you were just how you described all that speaks so well. My goodness, um, I think it happened um, when I was a lad. When I was when I was quite young, I was in. I remember uh, I was in boarding school um, from eight to eighteen, ten years early part of my life. And we had a, there was a company, WH Gays and Sons, which was a family company. It had been going since the late uh, 1879 or something. And here we were in the sixties. And I remember uh, asking my father about it. What do you have, what do I have to do to get into your company? And he said, well, you need to go to university and study civil engineering. And I remember a sort of iron wall descending in front of me. I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't do that. I just can't do that. And I just seemed to, I, I was the kind of person that wanted to, I, I needed to know where I was headed. I, I didn't like to wander in my mind uh, the direction. But then I, um, I, found, uh, I found the theater uh, when I was 10 or 11. And my mother was a great amateur and, and kept getting, taking me to various productions. I saw a production of Richard III actually outside uh, in one of the, the, the great houses of, uh, it was in Surrey in England. And, um, and, and, and just being so beguiled by that, by this dreadful character that everyone is drawn to. And then when I was 13, I went into the senior school and they did Shakespeare plays every year and I was cast as Ursula in Much Ado About Nothing. It was the last time, last year that the boys played the girls' parts. And um, I was very, uh, I was very pretty. I, I think that, that was firmly established um, with a nice wig on and a pretty dress. Um, but all that aside, um, Aha entered around that time where I found I had an ability uh, uh, in, in desire, to read more of these plays, to understand more. And the fact that here was something that people said, you're good at that. And, and, I, and I, I'm not sure I was good at much else, um, but I was good at that. And um, I've never put it down ever since. And I've had a lot of aha moments since then uh, where Shakespeare's concerned. But that was the moment, and I went to theater school when I was 18, Bristol Old Vic, and, and on and on and on. Uh, but I kept being reinforced by Shakespeare, 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 and, uh, and here we are today. It's been a life immersed in it, which I'm very grateful for. Oh, those are such gorgeous answers and like such different streams that all three of you came through it. And I think that's the fantastic thing about kind of finding classics and where you come in and how you interpret them and where you take them. Um, I, I want to kind of jump in because there are, uh, we're outdoor theater and just start asking some questions about like, I have a question about how climate change has affected your practice as outdoor companies, companies that are so close to nature. Um, and do you find, are, are you adjusting things artistically to to meet that challenge. <laughs> Christopher, do you want to jump in first? Okay, yeah, the first uh, quick uh, quick response, and I don't know if this is the same for Eva or Rodrigo, but um, what we find in Vancouver, one thing that uh, certainly is impactful it, um, are the summers uh, with the forest fires. Um, and and I, there are many theatres that uh, I know, Ashland, Oregon, massive impact, and I'm sure many other uh, theatres, I, I expect Canadian too, but um, 
that's that's beginning to be an issue um, uh, because of uh, because of the air and especially if there's a lot of physical activity um, let alone for the audience with anyone has breathing problems so anyway so that is one thing which is uh, greatly concerning uh, and we've had a lot of uh, talk and uh, and actually built policy around it inside our company yeah I know at Caravan, we've adjusted, we've moved up our entire summer show by about 10 days because the last couple of weeks of August are usually are so bad that we can't in good faith put, put our actors out yep. and perform in it. So we've just adjusted it by like moving our whole, our whole block up a couple, mm -hmm. a couple weeks earlier. Uh, Eva or Rodrigo? Eva, maybe? Yeah, um, we've had to... Toronto can be hit with, uh, in 2019, we had a stream of heat waves mm -hmm. that made it um, very challenging to work outside. Thankfully, our play space is underneath these two beautiful willow trees, which yeah. provide this sort of natural air conditioning. Um, but it does, it, it is a, an ongoing conversation because we are venueless. We do not, like we work in the park, we rehearse in the park, the park is our community. Um, so in those days where it's so, so hot or it's, uh, or it's raining or our, like a week of runs gets rained out, um, we, that, is a, that is an ongoing problem, which we've had to like uh, explore. One thing that we've done is that we have our last weekend, we have a rain venue, which is a nearby church uh, that we go to in the event it's been raining. Um, but it is, uh, the extremeness of the weather makes it very difficult to perform outside and to plan outside. Um, and we also have adjusted our budget so that our box office gets, uh, does not take up a huge amount or is not um, a huge source of income because we know that uh, we might get rained out so often. Totally. Yeah, Rodrigo? Similar, similar concerns. We've noticed, I mean, prairie, prairie, the prairies are famously windy and, and there's no protection, you know, there's no mountains or, or no topography. It's just this like line and the horizon is vast. So the, um, the wind has always been a, 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 a famous foe or friend when performing outside for us. What we've noticed in, in recent years is that the instability has grown. You know, we've, we, we always want to move outdoors. We rehearse indoors and then we move outdoors to the park, uh, Heritage Park we, we, we perform at here. And this year, of course, we want to move outdoors even earlier because it's safer. So we're rehearsing for only one week indoors and then moving outdoors uh, 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 as soon as possible. But we're also concerned about, about by the instability. It, uh, we, within the same week, we can have plus 30 and then, and then minus two, like this in, in the prairies in, in May and June. Um, I noticed that rehearsing, rehearsing our show in 2019, it was, it was just so up and down. And, um, and similarly, you know, not uh, like we have booked a week to film our, we were filming our show at the Ruins this year, not doing live, sadly. We booked a week to film the show with two days built in um, as rain days because if you're rain, you can film. So that kind of like, you know, uh, um, planning is, is, is even more delicate every year, even more like we can't count on this, we can't count on that. Um, but uh, yeah, like we're performing nature is such a privilege, it's such a, a beautiful thing. And sometimes, you know, like I'll never forget doing Hamlet and then, and then during the, the, the graveyard scene, we heard an owl like a real owl there, you know, it's magic. Nothing beats it, you know. Um, but then but then on a windy day and the trees are just all over the place and then you just sh you can't even look at your partner just shouting straight ahead, you know, straight on to the audience just delivering this this wave of text. It can be it can be overwhelming. So I think the instability and the the, the inability to 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 plan how the weather is going to be is really like the thing that's that's worrying us now. And just to kind of follow up on that idea of like being reactive and and with instability, do you find that the the practice of coming out of working outdoors and working with nature and kind of it being it being so mercurial and you're having to negotiate its moods has that shifted over to handling covid and like handling a pandemic and working in live theater during a pandemic? 
<laughs> I think so. And also that the conversation is really tied to accessibility, right? It talks about accessibility really are at the forefront now. So like for us, it's it's we do promenade shows, which means the audience moves about with the actors from scene to scene. So that is the appeal of the experience that they come in and then they have this immersive experience and they, but they have to pick up their chairs and move about, you know, uh, um, uh, terrain that's a bit rough sometimes. So the appeal of it is also the challenge of it that folks with mobility issues, that's very difficult. So we've been talking about filming our experiences for a few years now. And then the, with COVID hit, that has been expedited because we want to make sure that everybody can 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 enjoy the park in some way or, or another. So accessibility and COVID mitigation and climate change, it, it, I think often our mistake is thinking that they're separate issues. They're all super connected, super connected. And how we solve them, how we maneuver through them, it has to be connected always. And that's the challenge of it, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, obviously there's going to not just the arts, but everybody. Uh, there, there will be a lot of changes in the world because of the COVID pandemic uh, going forward. Um, people will do things in different ways. There will be adjustments and we shall in the theater too. Uh, it's, we're going to have to adjust as, as time goes by. Um, even when this uh, goes away um, but um, and, and one of the things I think um, will be that that streaming part uh, where some companies were able to do that uh, but they were the ones that generally uh, with a great deal of money because it's extremely expensive um, and, and uh, so I think that will start to be built in uh, now to probably most companies, as you say, Rodrigo, and maybe the same with Eva too, and, and many others. Uh, at, at this year, next year, it will be built in. There'll be a way of either streaming or filming, and we'll, it, 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 in a sense, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Rodrigo's touching on it like a very um, important point that, uh, what is so beautiful about performing in public spaces and performing in parks is that it is accessible to many people. Um, like we have, like folks watch our rehearsals, folks watch our shows and we don't like, we don't turn people away ever. That's a very, that's a tenant of the company. So in this moment of knowing audiences are craving connection, they're craving live connection. How do you, um, how do you carry that over? into these digital spaces? Um, how do we reach people in a way, if they have been used to more um, of an analog sort of dialogue with us? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that knowing that the pandemic has been hard on so, so many people, um, what's exciting for me is that we're pushing towards uh, more pay what you can content, more free content, uh, knowing that people are coming out of this with heavy burdens and that art should be accessible to everyone at all times. Uh, and yeah, what Christopher said about how certain companies um, have access to those sorts of resources. Um, I know for, I can only speak for myself, but it's for, for me, it's a moment of, okay, what resources do I have and how can I spread those out? How can I redistribute so that uh, we're not losing a, the beautiful theater ecology that exists right now and the many, many stories that deserve to be told? Gorgeous. Um, I, I kind of have to, just to build on, on that question, and this is something that I know Caravan, we're a rural company, we're in the interior of BC, and we have just not grown technologically, partially just because our access to power, our access to um, like internet, this is the first time, uh, two months ago, we couldn't have done a Zoom like this because we didn't have fast enough internet here. So it, it, we're really, I mean, late to these things, but also we've just kind of gone to the elemental roots always of what theater was and in terms of its kind of basic. And so I know we were slow to the 
um, technological switch of what this has been and trying to figure it out in our own capacity in terms of what's the gathering and how um, I, speaking of, I am on satellite internet, so if I dip out for a second, which I think I just did. Yeah, but you're <laughs> talking about, we knew, we're like, oh, this is the moment, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I'm at, I'm at the whims of a big satellite in the sky. <laughs> um, I, I, what I, what I would like to ask, just because come, kind of coming out of, um, of climate change and then COVID questions, is what, what in your work brings the most joy? To you, to you personally, what what is that thing where you're like, yes, oh yeah, this is why I do it. Um, and it can change, it can be in this moment today, or it can be, this is a big joy, this is this. But, yeah. uh, for me, the thing that immediately comes to mind is the people. Like I, uh, Shakespeare and the Rough works under a flattened hierarchy. So we have a collective leadership and it's myself and Caitlin Reardon. And then um, our associate artistic director is Desiree Leverins. And they, um, uh, and we also have a youth coordinator who is named Akramayash. And they uh, are possibly the people that have uh, saved me <laughs> through this whole, through the, so is it for 2020? Because, um, the we know that we create under joyous spaces in in buoyant spaces and to foster that in each other and to know that um we want that to trickle out into the communities that we reach and uh that joy is a radical act and joy and uh laughter is a political movement uh so for me i just i'm so grateful for the people that uh cross my cross my path Amazing. Rodrigo, Rodrigo, you go. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think you, you're dead right, Eva. It's, it's, it's always the people, you know, like from Mr. McLeod to Ian Watson to the actors that we work with to, you know, the, the conversations that we have daily, you know, through this mess. Uh, and, 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 and like when we find ourselves, you know, dreaming together about a project, dreaming about how we're doing this play this way or that way it's so it's so it's so much pleasure it's mm. so fun it's so like you know like we do theater for all sorts of reasons absolutely we have we have political we have you know uh we have uh, uh, uh artistic reasons we have all kinds of reasons why we do theater but at the end of the day it's also just pure pleasure <laughs> my god it feels good you know it feels good to just be in the room with with actors or be at a park and just throw some words around and try to make sense of them together. Like when we're all trying to make sense of like, what is it saying here? What do you think? What do you think? Like, and in that you find a common understanding about what it is to be alive. Nothing beats that. Like I, I remember, you know, the days you leave rehearsal and it's like, God, that was a good day. We didn't do anything or accomplish anything in the sense of like make anything, but we had some great conversations and that's what we're missing right now. Just being in the same space and feeling the energy and having those great, sexy conversations about making sense. God, I miss that. I really miss that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, and, and I agree. I think um, two or three things, but I, I think the primary thing uh, is, is missing my artistic colleagues. Yes, we have all this. This is good, this is good. But uh, to be actually with people coming into my office with uh, especially artistic, uh, when when back when you could be in your office um, and and come in, I got this idea, or a director coming in and saying, um, "We could do this, we could do that." And all that talking about actors, talking about plays, uh, and and what we can do with them, and so forth. That is always the most exciting because chiefly, I don't know about uh, these two, but uh, for me, I, I get buried in, in, in administration uh, and fundraising, which I enjoy. I enjoy it all, uh, but uh, that, that can amass to greater than the artistic if you're not terribly careful. And uh, anyway, so it's just a relief uh, to talk artistically. And I love, uh, if you talk about joy, I've always loved the moment of when uh, 
I go down uh, practically every night with my, my wife, Jennifer, and we, we arrive, let's say it's uh, 50 minutes before the show. And it's, it's always made me think at Bard because we are at these massive tents in this beautiful Bard village. It's like the Sermon on the Mount. All these people mm -hmm. are approaching from all directions mm -hmm. to come together for this special moment to be together. And, uh, and, 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 it's, a, and it's meeting friends uh, people who have the similar passions that we do, and it's uh, it's it's just a glorious uh, glorious moment, and uh, and that's the joy of the theatre, and that's why we love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, I have a question here from um, from the audience. Going back to the aha moments, moving forward, what initiatives do you see to capture the vision of getting interest in Shakespeare? or growing it so that it doesn't be just looked upon as old or fuddy-duddy. Um, do you have a, a sense of a mission to grow audiences or actors dedicated to Bard or to others? Like how, how do we go beyond, how do we keep building, how do we keep inventing? And kind of maybe if you want to speak to where personally or artistic practice, Eva, you spoke a little bit to this earlier in terms of approaching Shakespeare as like found text and that kind of vision towards it. But I'd love to hear a little bit more in terms of how do you take one playwright and keep changing and keep inventing and, and where does that go? Where's the growth of that going for, for your practice personally? Um, Rodrigo, do you wanna go in here? Uh, sure, yeah, no, I, I think often the mistake we make is to think that there's theater and all the playwrights that make up theater and then there's Shakespeare and then he's asking <laughs> for something else that is not, you know, and he's asking the same things that all other playwrights ask of us, you know, just open heart and humanity and trying to make sense of it. I think I love approaching his plays always uh, uh, from the perspective of what they, they could mean now. I think the, uh, I think the history of, 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 of his plays are a history of adaptations from the time he was writing them, he was adapting them and cutting them and changing them. They were always the instability of those texts is what really turns me on to them. The possibilities of those texts is what, what turns me on. I never saw it as a fixed thing. I, 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 I'm deeply excited by translations in other languages. So every time I do other, I do his plays, I, I, if actors speak different languages, we throw that in. Like I'm that that I find that fascinating how Shakespeare can morph and 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 be massaged through different languages and by extension, different cultures, because every translation is by, by definition, by default, a cultural adaptation. You can't escape that. That turns me on deeply. And then, uh, and then through, through education as well. You know, I find that sadly, a lot of people uh, are traumatized by Shakespeare in school because of several reasons. Um, and I find that if you are able to, to teach Shakespeare in, a, in, a, in an accessible way, in a way that it, he wrote for you now here, um, that can make a huge difference in somebody's life. I know it made for me, it changed my life when, when, when my teacher was, was, was that open um, uh, with, this, with this invitation to, for me to explore and find myself in it. So for me, it's always through that perspective that that he should be approached, you know, as a playwright for now, I have no like desire to do like, you know, like I, I find the tights and the cod pieces a bit dead. Like I, I, we've all seen the Hamlet version with the dry ice. And then the, 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 we've all seen that for me, you know, it's like, I can't do, I just can't do it anymore. Uh, so um, I just, I just, I love, I love to mess around in his plays because I find the canvas is so big that you can throw all kinds of layers on it, all kinds of colors, it will hold. Like he, he's, he can take it, he can take it. He's big that way, he can take it. So, for, so get in there and mess around with it and find your voice through it, your voice, your way. There's no, you know, there's no like a, a, a thing you must, must prove to, to be worthy of Shakespeare. He's, he's, a, he's a world of possibilities. For sure. Eva, you spoke a little bit to this earlier, but I'd like to just kind of, are you still in the process when they brought you on and you were saying this was my approach? Is that still your approach to Shakespeare? Um, yes, to, to I, I treat the text like living, breathing text. 
And with living, breathing text, sometimes you say, hello, text, go out the door. And then sometimes you say other text, come on in. Uh, so with these plays, a lot of the time I ask myself, like, what is, what is the, what is the real nugget that I love? And uh, exploding that a little bit bigger. And that can mean that, uh, that means that we might be cutting the plays so that there's certain themes that are highlighted, or that means that we're also um, taking bits of text from other Shakespeare and putting it all together and then telling a story that we wanna tell. Like, I think that there, uh, yeah, as Rodrigo says, there's no right way to do this. And I think it is such a, a beautiful blank canvas that we can really, um, dig into and dive into and um, constantly interrogate because with Shakespeare there's a lot of elements that um, you know it's pretty easy to go through and be like okay I'm going to cut the racist line okay I'm going to cut the misogynist line but there's um, those sorts of uh, problematic for me or, or harmful values that are embedded inside of those stories to lean into them and to really interrogate them so that you aren't presenting something on stage that is uh, classist or uh, sexist and without any kind of questioning. Um, because I do believe we put problems on stage and we, we, we grapple with them as audiences, as artists, that is important in public discourse. So really looking, okay, what is this play? And what also can this play be is very exciting to me. Gosh. Well said. Um, goodness me. Well, all, all the things that you just said, Eva and Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo that's, that's, that's who we are too. And my personal predilections, it's, it's all the same. And, and in, in that way, Bard is uh, um, a contemporary company. Uh, we, we're not lagging behind in, 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 in any of those ways. And in terms of adaptation, in terms of inter interrogation, we do all that. Um, and, but it's interesting in a life um, that someone like me, obviously older, uh, if you go back in time, if I go back in time, I know that's not particularly useful to people now, but it, nevertheless, it's part of my life. Um, if you go back in time to when I was, say, a young actor or even Bard's early years, uh, 32 years ago, when we our first season in 1990, um, so much has changed since then. Uh, so much. It's, it's like a revolution. Uh, it, it, it truly is. Uh, and, and, and it's terribly exciting. Uh, our audiences, as we grew, as I grew, uh, I was a different kind of theater person 30 odd years ago, seriously. Uh, and that's perhaps another conversation. Uh, in terms of, as you talk about Rodrigo, uh, uh, in traditional work, which, which was always something that uh, I loved. I loved it. Um, but times have changed. And I went along with that as it, as it changed, our audience followed. So it, it was a, a beautiful development really for, for us here in Vancouver. And as we changed and developed and investigated and interrogated and adapted, uh, so our audience came with us and uh, they trust us. And uh, it's a very healthy thing that has happened. And the agency of actors, how it used to be in a rehearsal room all those years ago, remembering I've been in the theater now for uh, 49, nearly 50 years. Um, there was no agency for an actor in 1973. No, uh, but it's different now and it's good and it's better. It's, uh, it's a living, breathing thing, the theater. And uh, we're blessed to be a part of it. Okay, I have, a, I have a great question that I wanna ask that's maybe a little bit of a respite from these real delphins is what is your, this only happens in outdoor theater story. Like what is that? Cause I feel like most of the caravans are like a horse farting at a right moment. And then, <laughs> and then you've lost the audience for about 15 minutes where you're like, well, it's too funny. Like I can't get it back. I'll never top that. <laughs> but for, for <laughs> the three of 
Oh my, that only happens in outdoor theater. That's incredible. And it can be a little story or it can be a little, you know, it's a, a funny thing or a moment of, you know, wonder at the nature and elements. I remember the geese flying by, the bird is open at one end. We have, you know, we're under tents. And I remember in the production of Lear, I think it's the fool that says, winter's not done yet if the wild geese fly that way and they flew across. Yeah, that was pretty great. That's extraordinary. I love those moments. Yeah. Eva or Rodrigo, any of those little gems? Yeah, uh, a couple years ago, we did an adaptation of Julius Caesar that was called Portia's Julius Caesar, written by Caitlin Reardon. Uh, and she very smartly, similar to the original, uh, the play, the action rises and in the middle, Caesar is murdered. Spoiler. Uh, but uh, there's the last week of our sh run, it's Labor Day, so there are fireworks. So there, there's this moment there uh, in this play, all these characters are getting more and more tense and every now and then there was like a boom. And I was like, oh crap, I forgot it was this time. I forgot it was this weekend. This is, this is going to be so annoying. This is going to be so frustrating. Um, and then, but what happened was there was a moment that we built into the play where essentially chaos ensues when Caesar is murdered. Uh, and the world erupts into war essentially. And that was the moment when all the fireworks started going off. And so it was booms, 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 and like all this, like this beautiful thing. And it looks like it was, it looked so planned by us that people thought our budget was way bigger than it was. So very pleased about that. Extraordinary, I love that. <laughs> um, I have two little moments uh, come to mind now. One was in 2019 when we were doing a, a school matinee of Hamlet. Um, we was doing the the whole the fair the very famous skull routine bit the whole sketch uh so when uh, when the actor uh, heather was playing hamilton she 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 and this scene was was staged near the parking lot so she takes the uh, skull from from the grave digger and it's the most iconic moment in the play and then that's when the school driver decided to repark the school bus so she takes the skull and is about to speak, and you hear, du, 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 du. <laughs> it just, there's, so, it, it was so like, it was like, you know, the, 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 the divine and the, and the, and the, the, the low of Shakespeare, which is in all of his plays, for me, that really kind of just hit me so hard, and it made me laugh, because uh, mm -hmm. it was, you know, at this moment of, you know, it can be such a, such a, an, a, a, a stuffy moment, but then it became unadorned by that, by that hilarious, you know, uh, 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 backing up of the bus. But then also in 07, doing Merch to Venice, and I was playing Bassanio, and during the trial scene, just this heated, heated moment. And um, and Shylock was just told he, he, he had to, you know, give up his faith, give up his identity. And it was, it, the whole scene was just charging to that moment. And then he's just, He's told what he's gonna do, he has to do, and he's standing there taking that in. And at that moment, lightning in the skies just opened up and then poured rain just came down. And it was just so like on cue, just so beautifully like divine that that dramatic moment happened and the skies just opened up. It was divine, yeah. I love those moments. We did a production of um, the Scottish play here, you know, 15 years back. And the and at the kind of witches scene and Hecate comes out and is around and was an actor on stilts and we had um, horses crossing with like veiled riders in the back and all of this and at that moment out of nowhere out of a blue sky rolls in black clouds thunder lightning torrential rain and uh, the stage manager who got out of the booth and was standing in the rain going like if I can stand it the audience can stand it <laughs> and keeping the show going. And was like, I'll stand here until, and then like the power went and we're like, okay, <laughs> that's the end then. <laughs> but it was, uh, I felt like we'd conjured something that was extraordinary. Yeah. And that's also what I love about outdoor theater. Cause you are, you're all in it together. Like yeah. there's, 
you're all either cold together, you're all, it's, you're all in the same, you're all under the same uh, trees or the same sky. Like, it's just, it's very humbling, I think. And that's why I'm like, that's why I don't ever believe that outdoor theater can be stuffy or can be pretentious because we're, our, we're sitting there in our shorts and our blanket and sneaking our little wine out of our water bottles. Like it's, it, there's no pretension there. <laughs> Um, I have a couple more questions from the audience. I'm going to jump to uh, just one question towards how to make Shakespeare more culturally diverse in terms of content. So not just hiring um, culturally diverse actors, but how do you how do you shift that content? I say rewrite it. Like, yeah, just just hire and hire a, an adaptation team um, and uh, because it's so pot like you Shakespeare is public domain, so you can do what you please. Um, and uh, you there's lots of ways to just think of it as a piece of um, yeah device theater that you if you want to look at if you want to explode certain themes go that way. Um, because uh, if we do want to make the argument that Shakespeare is universal, which I think is questionable, but there is universality in some of these themes. So you take those themes and you create and you uh, truly uh, empower the authentic voices of the creators and, and provide processes and provide space for people to bring their full humanity. So it isn't just an aesthetic choice, it is actually deeply rooted in the way you create. Uh, uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, you, you, it's beautifully said. Absolutely, and I think I think every classical, I think a classical company that is not in touch with the present can't make the past live. You know, like you really have to be in touch with the present, and and we live in a very very uh, uh, complex and very very multicultural society, and that's a beautiful thing. And the possibilities, as you say, Eva, are 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 there for 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 groups or you know artists to explore. We also engage in uh, new play development at SIR, and uh, we're right now uh, developing a, um, a new play called The Dark Lady by Jessica B. Hill, which looks at Emilia Bassano, a contemporary of Shakespeare, the possible dark lady of his sonnets, um, and how her career and her works uh, as a playwright and a poetess uh, during Shakespeare's time were, were, should be seen as, as influential as Shakespeare is today. And for several reasons we all know, are not as well known. Uh, so engaging new play development that touch uh, that we call Shakespeare adjacent or Shakespeare inspired, I think is deeply important for for classical companies if they can to engage with or support a new way of looking at these plays. Because again, they can hold. They can hold absolutely. They can hold. They are popular. Shakespeare is so popular in Brazil. Like new translations come out every year. And 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 I was doing a workshop with a group in Brazil last week. And we had the playwright in the room with us, in the Zoom room with us. And it was like the closest I've ever felt to Shakespeare himself. It was like I was asking questions to him. Why are you choosing this word? And the guy was alive with me in the Zoom room translating Shakespeare. And he felt like we were working on a new play, even though it was Othello. We're like, but I could ask the question, why are you choosing this word? And it was just phenomenal to work in this way, to work with, like you're saying, Eva, empowering other cultures, other artists to, 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 to see themselves through Shakespeare and find the plays anew. I think it's so exciting. And Shakespeare will be so happy about, about seeing that, I find. So happy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, if, I've always, I, throughout my career, it's certainly it, it, at Bard, um, I've always been a one that, if there's a word there that uh, is, it, maybe incomprehensible. People just haven't heard it before. Uh, I've always been an advocate for change it, change it. It's okay. And now, and uh, definitely, um, we, we, we cut liberally. Uh, and, uh, and it's a really, really good thing uh, because uh, just trotting out uh, the text, uh, that is no longer relevant, nobody really understands. It doesn't advance the plot. It's just out with it. And, um, and totally, as Eva says, with the adaptation of Shakespeare, which is almost across the board now, uh, in portions of it or the general theme of it 
or certain sections of it, you're going to have to do it as you interrogate that work. Uh, it's, it's, it, I don't believe it uh, stands on its own any longer. And uh, so we're all moving, we've all moved in that direction, definitely. Beautiful. I have a question for kind of um, each of you in terms of if you could go back to yourself at the beginning of your like tenure and just give yourself one thing, like a little sentence here, this will help. <laughs> what would that be if you could go back to the beginning and kind of go like, you might need this, you might want this little seed. Or maybe all the mistakes you made are the reason we're here <laughs> too. <And> maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's good. But if you could go back and give offer yourself a little seed of advice, what advice would that be? I think uh, what I, I perhaps felt but had no words for, I felt a compulsion um, um, to, to, to begin the company. Um, um, it's a phrase that I've, I've learned now, um, whatever you can do, or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. Uh, if I'd known that, uh, I, I, I think I just felt it, but that's it in words. And, uh, and I think for people, um, either on this uh, webinar or um, in the theater or the arts in general, or perhaps anything, um, that's pretty good to get going. Don't stop now, follow your passion and so on. And, um, and just to never, never, never give up, especially now. Yeah. Eva or Rodrigo, a little seed you could give yourself. I, I became I became a full-time AD with SAR in the fall of 2019. So <laughs> most of my tenure has been under COVID. Yeah. And I wanted to be an artistic director, uh, especially after four years at Stratford, I felt that I had very little control over my career. It's a wonderful place at Stratford. I met wonderful people, but it's also a very difficult place to be sometimes if you wanna have any sense of sort of like designing a vision for what you want your career to be. So I was obsessed with this idea of like, I want to have some creative control in my life. I want to be an AD. And then, <laughs> so I went into it with this idea of like, I can exercise creative control. And then COVID happened. And then I was like, of course, there's no control. That's an illusion. There's never any, you know? So I, I would have told myself um, that just don't, don't get so hung up on this idea of having to, control your path because there's so many things especially in the life in the theater especially now under covid that are really not in anybody's control and you just have to roll with it and i would have told myself just to be a little more patient especially in the beginning just be a little more patient you know you are an artist but now you're also an administrator and and so much as as christopher you're saying so much of our life since march 2020 has been emails, Zooms, reports, grant applications, phone calls, no actual beauty in the way we've come to know beauty as. There's no release. There's, it's, it's a constant act, of, you know, it's like a, a, a boiling kettle and the, the lid is always like this. And some days it kind of just, you know, there's no release. It's frustrating. So I would have told myself, as I tell myself every day, just, just be patient. It will take a while. And, and it's okay if you're mostly an administrator right now because the theater, your theater needs that right now to get through this. It's not about you anymore. It's about the artists that need work and need money and need access. It's about them. You're just here to help. Um, so I told myself like, don't stop thinking about yourself so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. always great advice. <laughs> I think I tell, uh, yeah, I think I would tell myself to talk to these two because th that's <laughs> wonderful advice <laughs> from both sides. Um, I think, and I, I still do this and I still catch myself doing this, is that um, I replicate what I think leadership should be. 
So I'm like, I'm pretending, I, I, I feel like I'm like putting on a leadership hat and pretending that I'm something else. Um, whereas I think that there are so many kinds of leadership and they're uh, fine, like really being true to my leadership style. And that my leadership style includes uh, taking silliness very seriously. And my leadership style also includes failure and mistakes and uh, ex like finding happiness in those. Um, but that's, that's tough when you're constantly like looking at things and being like, that is how it should be. But that's not how it should be. There's so many ways it can be. Yeah, being true to yourself. It's so important. Um, I have, we're, we're getting close to our time, but I, I wanted to ask if there's a piece of text that's resonating with any of you right now, like something that you keep finding. Mine is like when I go home to my bed and I just look at it and say, I love nothing in the world so much as you is not that strange. <laughs> oh. I but think it... <laughs> those, those lines, I love those lines, uh, just so uh, and the, the other other ones from that play, there was a star danced and under that was I born. I think that's Beatrice's line. It's just, I do love nothing in, in the world so well as you. It's not that strange. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And to thine own self be true. And in must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Yeah. Yeah. Rodrigo, Eva, text that, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Shakespeare, but things that like a little quote or a poll that is, it's really important to you right now or inspiring you right now. Um, one thing that, uh, one poem that I love is by Mary Oliver. It's a, it's called The Summer's Day. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, quiet, it's about stillness. Um, and the last, the last line is something around, um, uh, I tried to find it on my phone so I could like do a poetry reading, but I didn't find it. Um, but the last line is, is something around, um, tell me what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? Yeah. And I think in these moments where we feel like everything has stopped, it's not stopped, our hearts are still beating. There's so much joy to be had and so much love to give. So how do we find, like, how do we pass that through our Zoom screens? Yeah, beautiful. Excellent. Rodrigo, piece of text. Uh, yeah, two lines that I think of, you know, I think of politicians, I think when I think of this. One is from All's Well, which is no legacy is so rich as honesty. Mm. And from here in the eighth, um, things done well and with a care exempt themselves from fear. So I keep thinking about those two lines, and I, and 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 to touch in, in, in as a touchstone, um, in terms of my Latin American culture, I I've been reading Pablo Neruda. Sometimes I think of Neruda, and I think of to get in touch with that idea of language as a sensual experience, because mm -hmm. language is is such a, a such a powerful. You know, a lot of this conversation during this time has been about language, right? How we how we talk. And how we how language is always changing. So I, I this idea of language is a sensual, ever morphing thing. I think of Neruda and I think of all those sexy, sexy poems of his and sonnets, and it keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, that feels like the perfect place to end this conversation. It's been actually such a joy and pleasure to talk with the three of you. Um, and I just want to let our audience know uh, that the video will be up on Bard's YouTube channel in a few days, so you can watch it again if you like, hear these beautiful quotes again, um, and share it with your friends. But thank you so much, the three of you, for this conversation. It was a true joy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Yeah.